Thank you uh, for giving this invitation uh, to speak. The first thing I want you to stop assuming. Nothing to assume in any of my talks, and I'll make sure it's uh, all good. So it was a wonderful talk. I was still trying to wrap my mind around it. But um, So I was asked to speak on current application of esophageal physiology tests for patient selection and surgical planning, basically what tests to do before we do surgery. And uh, disclosures, I'm one of the PI for uh, sites for endosim trial, but there is no relation to the present talk. It's, if you cut down to the chase, is esophagus is essentially a mucosal lined tube a muscular tube, it has only two jobs, get food from mouth to the stomach, and two, prevent it from coming back from the stomach into the esophagus and back further up. So normal physiology involves swallowing, which uh, is peristaltic activity in an aboral fashion, and a compliant lower esophageal sphincter that lets the food go into the stomach. And to prevent reflux, to do the other part, it is a competent lower esophageal sphincter and some degree of intact peristalsis that even if something comes up, it'll be pushed back into the stomach. So the pathology can, for at least for benign disease, when, can be clearly divided into two parts. Either the food doesn't go down, which is dysphagia, and can be either because of poor or absent peristalsis, or an outflow obstruction or a non-relaxing sphincter that it's not compliant enough. Or it is reflux, which is more common, but the, com the sphincter is not competent and it is made worse by poor or uh, weak peristalsis. Unfortunately or fortunately, we have no surgery or pretty much no medicines to offer for peristalsis, so that leaves the pathology to be looking at the LES from a surgical perspective. Hopefully things will change in future, but as of now, that's what it is. So what about the workup for esophageal disease? Now we know that we are basically looking at the sphincter, whether it's too tight or it's too loose in any pathological situation. And these are the four most common tests that we do, or says the physiology. We do a contrast esophagram, reflux testing, gastric emptying, and manometry, which is now pretty much high resolution and an extension now that is end of life. But I think that this is even more important. We have been taught since medical school, do a history, a careful history, and I'll bring to the importance of that again. And I think an endoscopy is a physical exam of the esophagus. And uh, really in a benign disease, there is no point to examine the rest of the body. Uh, well. There are no medical students here, right? Thanks. So uh, as for the history, I think um, when we see referrals, we are all seeing patients who have been either suffering from disease for a long time, and they have their own perceived symptoms. They, you know, they may have diagnosed themselves and used terms that may mean completely different. Uh, they may be, have been, haven't been told that they have a diagnosis by their primary care physician and made worse by a gastroenterologist that they have this diagnosis, whether it's reflux or spasms or whatever. But the most important thing is do it yourself. I think this is one aspect that I don't even uh, give it to uh, the mid-level because I want to get the patient's perspective directly. And it's very important that we parse out the actual symptoms. If reflux is happening and what, what is coming up and so forth. And I think I would uh, compound again is it's make your own diagnosis, not what the patient comes with, not what the primary care tells you, not what the gastroenterologist tells you. So this is for the physical exam. Uh, as part of the physical exam, we do it not at the same time in the clinic, but we are looking at how wide or how narrow the esophagus is and is there anything in the esophagus. Um, how does the sphincter or the sphincter mechanism look both going down and on retroflex view? Is it competent, incompetent, subjective assessment? And then what does the stomach look like? Is there any food in there? Is there any inflammation? And is there any narrowing of the pyloric channel? But now we come to the physiology, the physiological test that I was asked to speak. I think contrast esophagram is the single most important test uh, for benign esophageal disease. I would strongly recommend that we get more familiar with it and uh, get our radiologist to work on it with us. And uh, this is a picture that shows an epiphenyl diabetic limb, and this patient was treated for almost 20, 25 years for reflux, for PPIs with not much benefit. And uh, I think a video esophagram, though this is such a stark problem that uh, this would be picked up by, you know, any radiologist, but a video or a cine esophagram is very important. I recommend that we should do both supine and upright, a liquid and a solid phase, not just a 13 or a 14 millimeter pill, but actually a solid phase, preferably with a burger or bread or marshmallow. I just tell the patients to bring something that gets stuck and then uh, we dip it in barium and give it. It's just uh, getting the radiologist to do it predictably. Uh, it, it gets harder in bigger hospitals. It's a lot easier when I was in Omaha in a Creighton smaller hospital, and then now I'm in a 500-bedded hospital where there are 15 radiologists who might be doing it in a month. So, but, but we keep working on it. 
And then I think a time barium swallow or some assessment in an upright that how much of the esophagus empties or how quickly the esophagus empties uh, would, be a good, uh, would be a good idea. So next in the workup is uh, the manometry or the high resolution, which is very exciting and we uh, all get uh, uh, do, do a lot of work and there's a lot of information coming out. I think what has high resolution given us uh, as compared to the conventional or the five channel manometry has been, it's much easier to diagnose the classical disease. It's almost becoming like an x-ray. This is a hiatal hernia, this is type one or two ecclesia. And I think it's also thrown up a lot newer diagnosis in the face, especially EGJOO, you know, esophagogastric junction outflow obstruction. Primary air peristalsis, which in the conventional manometry, Dr. Castell used to say, oh, this is ecclesia, just that the sphincter uh, relaxes enough, but not enough. So we know that there is primary air peristalsis in independent of ecclesia, especially in uh, bad lung patients that we see a lot. And I think what we would like to see somehow that the manometry can tell us that what is the risk of post fundoplication dysphagia. And I put a question mark is that because that's a question we would like to answer and it is still a question that we have not been able to answer uh, very effectively yet. This is a high resolution manometry. It's a normal, uh, normal patient. There is a good peristalsis. We calculate the DCI, their normal values, and then the lower esophageal sphincter uh, relaxes there at the bottom uh, to allow the food to go through. This is normal. And uh, what we would say that this is an effective peristalsis or it's a little fragmented, it's mildly disordered, it is an ineffective, and then there is a failed peristalsis, and we would assume, and we would like to believe, that there is a declining effectiveness of esophageal peristalsis. That's what we like to believe. Uh, but none of them has been correlated with the problems with post-operative uh, or post-fundoplication dysphagia, and there are some new parameters that, has, that are being developed. A lot of work is being done out of, uh, I think, St. Louis by Dr. Prakash Gyali's group, and we're also looking at these things. And one was, it's, they're looking at a bolus clearance impedance uh, and the other is a contractile reserve. So this is the way they're looking at the impedance manometry. It's the same high resolution manometry, but the purple is the, is the bolus clearance. So the amount of impedance as the liquid goes down, does it get cleared? As you can see in the uh, wave on the left side, it is on the left side, is that there is a good clearance and the wave uh, and the entire purple thing went into the stomach, which is filled with fluid. On the next swallow, it was not a very effective peristalsis and the bolus stayed in the esophagus, indicating that there was an ineffective uh, peristaltic activity. And if a person has a lot of these, you would worry that the patient may have problems made worse after fundoplication. Uh, this is a concept of contractile reserve. It's in fact a, a pretty smart idea in which if you, what they do it is the end of the swallow study or the, after the 10 swallows, you make a person have five rapid swallows of very small two to three cc's each. And when you have a rapid degultation repeatedly, your esophagus, the first four swallows don't have any peristaltic activities. And at the end, there is a hyperperistaltic wave that clears, and this is normal. And this would mean that the esophagus is able to handle your, uh, your repeated swallows or putting your esophagus to the test. And uh, this would be the way the concept would work, that if on baseline, you may have a normal peristalsis or a little weak peristalsis, but when you uh, do the multiple rapid swallow, and you notice that in the second case that there is a peristalsis that developed after the multiple rapid swallow, that this person has a peristaltic reserve and would be able to overcome the extra resistance of the fundoplication as compared to the last person who does not have a peristaltic reserve, with the theory being that as we go down this path, as they have less likely to have a normal peristalsis or a normal peristaltic reserve, there would be an increasing concern for post fundoplication dysphagia. The group has, uh, Dr. Gowali's group has published some work on this for post fundoplication dysphagia retrospectively, but I think a lot more work can be done on this. The next two tests I'm gonna briefly talk about is the reflux testing and the gastric emptying. The reflux testing, I think this is the gold standard, the 24 hour off therapy. Either you can do a 24-hour catheter-based study, the advantage being that it's not going to slip down, and you can do two levels, proximal and distal, or you can do a Bravo, which is more convenient on the patient, and it's over a 48-hour period, up to 96 hours. Uh, impedance testing on therapy, I would leave it for the birds because it's good only for the gastroenterologist. I do not make decisions based on that. I'm sure there'll be some people who will um, disagree with me, especially if I was uh, in 
company of gastroenterologists, but I know Steve agrees with me. Uh, for proximal reflux testing, a lot of things have been tried. Proximal pH monitor, pharyngeal pH, and uh, even pepsin in the saliva, in the bronchial aspiration, in the pharyngeal biopsies. All these have been very small, one or two published reports, and, uh, but the outcome for surgery is not yet as predictable. So we all like to get a better answer if we can, uh, but I think that's something uh, we will have to work on. Uh, the gastric emptying study, just baseline, if your stomach doesn't empty, it's going to back up. It is a reflux, refluxogenic position. But unfortunately, the degree of gastric emptying on the study, nuclear medicine does not correlate with the patient's symptoms or on the endoscopic findings. A lot of times you have somebody who has food in his stomach, you do a gastric emptying study, comes back as normal. So I, I, I don't know, but uh, this is the best we have right now. So err to get it if there is any question. I don't get it for everybody, but a person who complains of significant bloating, uh, somebody who's on chronic opioids, has diabetes mellitus long-standing or scleroderma, I would definitely get it. Uh, somebody who has a completely normal looking sphincter but has pathological reflux, get a gastric emptying study because that could be the primary motivator causing increased reflux. And or if on endoscopy I see food in the stomach, though I don't know how it will change my plans, but I shall get it. Now that the tests are done, we have done the physical exam, the uh, history, and we have done all tests as we indicated, uh, what should we do? I think we should be able to come at a definitive diagnosis, whether the problem is a bad sphincter, not not letting the stuff out, obstruction, or too bad a sphincter because it lets everything back up. And then the decision would be that is the surgery wise? If you're planning to make the sphincter tighter, is there adequate motility? And if the sphincter is too tight, are we really sure that it is too tight and destroying it by either cutting it with a, with a poem or a heller, that doesn't matter, but are we sure that we should want to destroy something that it is bad enough? So now for reflux. Uh, most importantly, prove the diagnosis. And just, I'm going to keep getting back to it. Prove the diagnosis to your satisfaction. 24-hour uh, pH, like I said, is the gold standard. Uh, however, in a person who has got very classical symptoms, and I'll talk about uh, heartburn, not just some dis chest discomfort, bitter regurgitation, an excellent response to PPI therapy, uh, they're good for response, initial response at least, and that is consistent with an endoscopic findings of a hiatal hernia or esophagitis in a weak valve. So in that situation, I may forego a 24-hour pH study, but not otherwise. The proximal reflux parameters I talked about, I just won't use them alone as an indicator to operate. Maybe I want to get some corroboration of at least maybe a, a hiatal hernia, maybe uh, some uh, excessive distal esophageal exposure, if not all the way pathological, but I just don't think one alone is a good enough uh, to yet just op offer surgery. Maybe it will be someday, but not yet. So uh, once we know that it's a diagnosis, how do we assess motility? Unfortunately, for all its advancements, our hydrogen manometry has no reliable predictor which patients will have post-op dysphagia. That can be very universally applied yet. There are some processes being made, but high low esophageal sphincter pressure is the only predictable, both in the conventional manometry and in hydrogen manometry, that predicts that this person is more likely to have dysphagia. Uh, barium, uh, a good radiologist can subjectively say that this esophagus is in squeeze. You can expect that the patient is going to have more postoperative dysphagia than the one in which the radiologist says that the esophagus squeezes well. But again, it's a very subjective assessment. But the biggest, the best predictor of postop dysphagia is pre-existing dysphagia, while on the other hand, somebody about a third of the patients have dysphagia pre op it resolves postoperatively. So it's still a conundrum how to predict which patients will have unrelenting dysphagia, and there are some work being done on that. And, but uh, in addition to the, uh, like I said, the provocative testing with the uh, multiple rapid swallows and maybe the impedance pH, impedance manometry would help us. And then prior to doing a fundoplication or links or endosema, whatever procedure you do, or even TIF, I think if there is any suspicions for delayed gastric emptying, we'd assess and address it. Uh, now get to the second problem. Reflux is easier uh, to manage than dysphagia, I think so, because we're destroying something. Ecclesia, which uh, is pretty stra straightforward, much easier with hydrogen manometry. And then this new diagnosis of EGJOO. Some patients have swallowing problems, some people don't. It's a manometric diagnosis, not a clinical diagnosis. And then what to do with this major motility disorders uh, if they have clinical symptoms, such as chest pain and dysphagia being the most common ones. 
All of us have seen these three pictures, type one, type two, and type three ecclesia. We all agree that if we are comfortable in the clinical scenario, this is the manometry finding, get a barium swallow and then uh, offer them a myotomy and uh, whether it's a poem or a heller. Uh, now this is the new uh, diagnosis that has been thrown, which is EGJOO, esophageal gastric junction outflow obstruction. Uh, basically it's a high IRP with a normal peristalsis. And, but it doesn't correlate with symptoms. We have looked at different cutoff values of IRP. It doesn't correlate with symptoms. Uh, maybe it is the intrabolus pressure, which is a pressure above the sphincter, one or two centimeters above it. And maybe there is a role of this new emerging technology, endoflip, to look at that whether the sphincter is really not opening very well. This is the EGJOO in which on the left you can see that there is good bolus clearance because the pressure towards the left of the peristaltic wave is not very high, meaning their IBP or the intrabolus pressure is low. And on the right-hand side, there is a higher intrabolus pressure, meaning that there is an actual obstruction. So maybe uh, there would be uh, some understanding in, and the newer classifications will have IBP incorporated into making it clinically relevant. Uh, these are the three uh, major motility disorders, such as the jackhammer, the diffuse esophageal spasm, and a peristalsis. They have a uniform criteria. They have a normal low esophageal sphincter relaxation, meaning a low IRP. Uh, biggest thing about major motility disorders is do not operate on them, especially if you don't have any evidence of outflow obstruction. And do not operate for chest pain for those uh, bec because the chest pain is because of a spastic esophagus. You will be getting down the wrong path. So what can be done to assess the outflow obstruction more than what we have already done, Gen just beyond the IRP, or just beyond the, uh, the cursory barium swallow. Uh, the outflow uh, in the motility disorders, reassess the manometry yourself maybe. A lot of times the sphincter has just elevated because of it and it's not really relaxing as can be seen here. So this pretty much would be uh, an ecclesia sphincter in them. Or an upright esophagram that shows some degree of tapering. Look at it yourself rather than relying on radiologists. Provocative manu uh, maneuvers in having them drink a larger volume and see that there is some distal esophageal pressurization. Again, these parameters are coming up. Uh, a therapeutic Botox, or a diagnostic, which is actually quite di diagnostic. So if you have a spastic distal esophagus, you inject Botox and they get better, you know that it was part of the problem. And if you can, uh, in other clinical scenarios, then you might make a case for uh, uh, myotomy. And I think there is a big role of, uh, potential role for a new technology, endoflip. Uh, which is uh, proprietary, but it is basically a functional luminal imaging, and uh, it is a long compliant balloon, and then as it's distended in the lumen, it generates uh, a diameter at each level, and you can see what is narrow. So this is what, uh, if you have an EGJOO patient, and on the left, that's what it looks like, there is an area of relative narrowing. If it's less than five millimeters, then it is uh, definitely on the ecclesia spectrum, and you can look at the desensibility on the right side if it is especially if it's more than nine, then it's very unlikely, but we need better numbers and get some more data. But you can see the difference between uh, what kind of pictures you can get at, whether the sphincter is able to open up easily as the rest of the esophagus. Uh, so now back to the major motility disorders, my advice remains the same, don't operate on them unless you have evidence of outflow obstruction. But if you have evidence of outflow obstruction on a jackhammer, it becomes EGJOO. If it is a DES, it becomes type three ecclesia, and if it's a peristalsis, then it becomes uh, ecclesia type one. So you change the diagnosis if you can find an outflow obstruction. This briefly a case study I'll go very rapidly through. Just happened to me last month, actually. A 68-year-old male, two-year history of reflux, which he describes as things coming up, worsening for six months, started on PPI by a primary care, a year later doubled by the gastroenterologist, a negative, uh, endoscopy six months ago, and a barium swallow report that said, this is a copy of the barium swallow, moderate to free gastroesophageal reflux upon water siphon test. I had to actually look up what that is. No obstruction identified, and you can see this was done in February 26, 2018, with a negative endoscopy and the barium swallow showing reflux, he was referred to us for consideration for fundoplication. The first thing you can, what we did is we asked what comes up, and he said, whatever I have eaten. Feels it never makes it all the way down. Any drooling on the pillow? Well, I'm notice, notice, noticing it increasingly. Any response to PPI? He said, you know, not really, maybe, but not really. So given this history, I was worried of an obstruction and we did a proper Sine esophagram, and this was a report. Just within 
28 days, 26 days, so I'm sure the patient's pathology did not change, non-propulsive contractions, esophago-esophageal reflux. So a lot of time, a casual radiologist may, may call a distal esophagus to proximal esophagus reflux as gastroesophageal without paying attention. And the smooth tapering, and when they did the upright swallow, you can see there's almost a 15 centimeter column. So clearly the person is on an ecclesia spectrum being mistreated for almost two years. And uh, we did a manometry, which is uh, type two ecclesia. And so again, I cannot, cannot overemphasize, make your own diagnosis before you're going to operate. Uh, talk to the patient, it's, it's probably the best uh, physiological test you can do. Look and have the ability to at least question your own tests. And I recommend doing your own endoscopies. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot.